Everybody, thanks for tuning in. This is just a bit of a bumper intro to the uh, attached interview with Derek Sagay. Um, during the recording, I'd used a new webcam with a ring light and had three settings of brightness. Should have checked it out in advance, but I didn't. So long story short, the brightness was Solar Flare, uh, Count Floyd, Vampire Lestat, and Albino. I think I had it on Albino. It was pretty, it's terrible video. So what I did was I put a screenshot overlay over any video of me. And so that's explaining that. So um, the audio is pretty crappy too. So um, I don't recommend you get a webcam by, uh, I think it was made by Garaga, Garage Door Company. You'll get that one later in the interview. Anyways, it turns out it was a hilarious interview. It was supposed to be just a, kind of a QA. I'd asked Derek in advance if he wanted to send me some uh, uh prompting questions you can test the material out he said well i normally don't do material in my interviews so well we just uh, fly by the seat of our pants which we did and i gotta tell you it was about 50 minutes of uh it was a stand-up i i laughed so hard about 30 times it was hilarious we talked about things like his daughter uh, air canada uh garaga company uh, garage doors his worst ever um uh set where he bombed we talked about that we talked about uh politics very well read, man. Um, very, very funny. I mean, the guy is just hilarious. We talked about his favorite comedians, past and present, and that sort of thing. So without further ado, I will give this to you. And please subscribe, and I hope you enjoy. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Tuning into Border City Rock Talk, we get some great interviews with great interviewees of the comedic touch. Today, I've got a special comedian. Um, specifically, he is a comedian. I've got Derek Sagay. How are you doing, Derek? I'm good, man. Thank you very much. How are you? I am a million dollars shy of being a millionaire, as John Candy once said. But uh, um, I'm doing all right. Um, what's the opposite of uh, subs unsubscribe, Derek? I would say subscribe. All right, do as Derek says. Subscribe to the channel. I'm trying to get up to 200 by the end of the month. So I don't share that trick, everybody. What's that? I tricked everybody. <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to get you on uh, for a while now. I remember seeing you here in Sault Ste. Marie. I, I'm not too sure. I know you. Uh, you're just like a rock star in your own genre, where you you play many many dates, and it's hard to remember shows. Do you remember playing Sault Ste. Marie about three years ago? Yeah, it's like an arcade at the same time as being a big giant venue or something. There's there's all kinds of shit in there, right? Like pool tables and yeah, yeah. Was, I think there's a fist fight the night I was there. It was, it was a Sue Blaster, yeah, it was like an arcade for sure, for sure. Um, for the viewers here that don't know, they know of you, but they don't know some of your background. You you uh, you won an award in 2015. Uh, um, I believe that was for best comedian and that was it's linked with just for laughs correct it has a oh it's a uh, it's serious xm it's uh the canada's top comic right right and you're also it's you not... participating in the debaters for years um you've got your cds out and you've been touring internationally for years uh when did you uh, decide to be a full-time comedian uh roughly at what age uh, I only did my first even amateur set at 31, so I was kind of a late bloomer. Uh, it was 2008, the last when I finally would started doing this full time. So whatever age I was then, 2008, that would have been uh, what is that? 30? Uh, I don't know, 38, 37, something. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, 2008 was the last time I ever did anything other than show business. So what, what did you do? Funny story, though. I quit my job in 2005. I got just for laughs in 2005 okay. after being doing comedy for only a year. Yeah. And But I got just for laughs. So in my head, I was like, I see, I'm famous already. I'm just for laughs. I've, made, I've got it made. I'm the, I'm the next big thing. And then I did the just for laugh, and immediately after the festival was over, I went back to making like twenty five dollar a show, and I was like, "Oh shit, I probably jumped the gun quitting my job there." <laughs> I guess, I guess I had to hustle a little longer. So I, for three more years, I had to, 
Uh, yeah. Like I was doing contracting work and stuff. I was a consultant, as it were. Oh, is that right? And, uh, yeah, in advertising, I worked in advertising at the time. Okay, well, that would obviously come in handy for your uh, selling your own product right now, correct? You'd think, you would think. I suck at it so bad. I'm so bad at selling my own thing. I'm always well, extra. I, I was looking at your tour schedule, so you're, you're not setting up your own touring, uh, are you? The way you're going across. A lot of it, yeah. Like all the all my shows, mostly. I mean, I had a tour manager. I still work with him, but I mean, he's having. You know, he's got. He's trying to dig out of the the pandemic as well. Yeah. Um, but he's probably going to set up my next East Coast tour. But uh, I can't. I can't wait at this point. I mean, I'm. This is. You know, I'm very lucky. I count myself very lucky that I survived the pandemic. You know, like yeah. two years almost, where dick jokes were illegal. Um, at least, <laughs> at least in public. Yeah. So uh, I'm very, I feel very lucky, but I do have a financial hole that I ended up digging myself into through this. I probably should have curbed my lifestyle a little bit <laughs> since I wasn't making any money. But when you're not making money, it just gives you that much more time to spend money. So, uh, so yeah, I'm really eager to get back to work because uh, my my bankers are even more eager. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Um, you've got, uh, you've got three kids, correct? That's right. Okay. And my eldest moved out this morning. She left for Calgary this morning. Oh, she, uh, uh, just to work or university life. or? She's going to be, she's an Air Canada flight attendant as of, uh, today, I guess, but her first, on her first day of work as of, like, she just did all the training. So she, yeah. as of next week, she's on call. She'll be up there. Serving coffee, I guess. I don't know. What, well, saving awesome. lives. She'll be out there saving lives. You, you know, no, no, seriously, you must be proud. That's uh, that's a good vocation, and and it's got a lot of perks and benefits. I think, but maybe it's not. not. It's not 1962, Ernest. It's like you know, whatever. It's an okay job. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I wish, I wish for more for her, but I mean, it's uh, it'll. I I think it'll at least, at the very least will be a very good experience for, for that transition from, you know, kid to woman of the world, you know what I mean? Like, it, she's going to yeah. be living on her own. She's got a grown-up job. Yeah. Um, I mean, for listen, for me, I love traveling. So, you know, that friends and family discount that I, I'll get if she sticks it out for a while, that'll be very welcome. But, you yeah. know, I, I'm, I'm proud of her well beyond this this is i'm proud of her that she made it through the training which sounded really awful really? uh if she ends up making a career there canada i mean it, i'm torn here because i'm I'm, for, I'm a customer of theirs and i'm a shareholder of theirs um but as a customer i you know i'm like uh, like you know this they're a great employer. They have a lot of benefits, you know, the stock option and yeah. the cheap travel and the big business and the company will never fail because the Canadian government can't let it fail. Yeah. So there's all these things going for it. But every time I call there, I'm like, how is this still a company? What the f What do you mean you have to transfer me to another department yeah. that closed apparently 15 years ago? Because every time you fucking transfer me there, the line cuts off <laughs> and like it's just the most inefficient <laughs> play. Anyway. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, she lives in Montreal. Yeah. Her training was in Toronto, and now they have her station in Calgary. Are you telling me there's no fucking air flight attendants that live in Montreal? <laughs> they all have to, like, why don't you hire her out of the city where they're going to work? You Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I miss yeah, my yeah. daughter. That's all. And it's, uh, no offense, Air Canada. Please <laughs> give her employee of the month. <laughs> but. <laughs> So now I find myself booking already. She, she just left this morning, and I already find myself taking every single offer I get in Alberta just so I can go see her and check yeah, on her. Yeah, for sure, for okay. sure. Um, and you have the other two, uh, I guess they're younger. So um, I, was, I remember back when uh, you found out about that they were canceling of the schools and you had to, you know, you couldn't go golfing because these little were just like, what the? So how did you handle the last two years with... Um, these little faces around the house. Bro, it's been, yeah, I know, right? Like, just this morning, we're having a blizzard in Montreal this morning, and I'm like, I am bringing you to school. I don't care if the bus doesn't make it. You're going to school. <laughs> it was a lot of time to spend with your children. i got to be honest. It was quite a bit of time. 
to yeah. spend with your children. I, I, uh, I didn't even, am I allowed to swear on your podcast? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. That's generally the rule, right? It's your fucking <laughs> podcast. You can do whatever the hell you want. Yeah, yeah. You just can't um, criticize the government. Right. <laughs> uh, so yeah it was just it was a lot of time i i said often that um say everyone's like oh you have to adjust to working from home i'm like i ended up with full-on addictions just the things that would keep me away from the kid because like early on in the pandemic i found that if i walk out of the garage with a tool of some kind like a screwdriver or a hammer or whatever that's how i get the kids to go fucking hide in their room because they, they see a tool and they're like oh shit dad is doing a project i don't want to have to help i'm gonna go hide under my bed so i found myself just walking around in a tool belt all the time addicted like just doing nothing but home improvement shit just so i don't have to spend too much time with them <laughs> going around in an ikea box yeah <laughs> that's funny yeah uh, anyway so yeah so it's been uh it's been something and the, <laughs> again that oldest one somehow qualified for the serb she ended up making more on serb than she did at a job so it was like it was hoping for another pandemic i bet like you know <laughs> yeah i mean that's uh that's a challenge the government's facing right now is uh I've never seen so many help wanted signs in in stores that haven't been shut down as yeah. I have in my whole life combined as I do now because like my son works in a restaurant and luckily he works it's a good restaurant that take really they take good care of their staff. But so many other people that I know in the restaurant business are just they're not able to find people that want to work. Not for minimum like wage, it, no. There's been, it's which I find ironic. There's so much irony from this the this lockdown this pandemic that you know the years leading up to it you know a lot of like ndps of the world and uh you know even myself who thinking that in america bernie sanders wanted to increase the minimum wage yeah somehow this thing jacked up minimum wage just out of sheer you know supply and demand no one wants to work for minimum wage so you have to pay more or you're not going to have staff yeah Exactly. I, don't know, I don't know what people were doing. Like I don't, I don't, I don't understand it anyway. No, I mean, How was there a labor shortage when no one had a job for the last two years? Yeah, yeah. So, what did you do other than um, avoid your children for two years? Did you find anything to cope? Um, you did some virtual shows. I know that. I did. I did. Yeah. I got see again. Lucky. I just I fell into it. The first one I did was just because I had you know like when the first lockdown happened. I started to get the itch. If I don't do stand up on a regular basis, like if I go ten days without doing stand up, I get kind of, I start to tweak and like, and I get crabby and like my family notices it, right? Like if I start walking around the house slamming doors, the children like, oh, dad hasn't done a show in a while. <laughs> so I did that first online show just because I needed it, yeah. and the reaction was so huge. Uh, and like I was almost embarrassed at that, how well it did. Like it was, I think the first one had like 300 people at it, and I was like, "Oh my god, this is crazy!" And people were so kind too because I let people pay what they want, and yeah. people were paying more than what I even suggested as the price. You know what I mean? So I was like, "Oh my god, uh, this is so cool!" So I, like I said, off the top, I was very lucky. A lot of my peers really immediately hated the whole online comedy format. Uh, I didn't hate it. I mean, it's certainly no replacement for a live show, but right. uh, when it's the best you can get, I was, I was, I was uh, cherishing it. I was very appreciative of of, uh, of being able to do anything. So, so I ended up doing eleven of my own shows of the okay. the, the pandemic shows uh, online, and then maybe another few dozen corporate and private things. Two thousand. So, uh, yeah, I. Pardon. Did you say a few, a few dozen, a few dozen, 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 like 12, a few dozen, a few thousand. Yeah, I was doing 17 shows a day. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 my internet bill is fucked. I got so much <laughs> bandwidth, just a constant broadcast. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So I, I didn't hear you right. So um, you've got about eight shows or 10 shows booked with, um, you said with, is that with debaters? It's a debaters live, so there's the yeah, debaters yeah. that play on CBC, and then there's the live touring show that's not recorded. So you know, if we slip shit in there, it 
doesn't matter because it's just live for the audience. But as it, as it ha as as luck would have it, or as it is, um, the show uh, actually has a lot of younger fans. So we actually we are even when it's the live version, we are pretty careful because you'll often have ten and twelve year olds in the audience. Oh well, I mean, but just, the parents uh, that are going to bring those kids there should be aware. Well, they're bringing them to the debaters, though, right? So they've heard the debaters on CBC Radio. Oh, it's yeah, very, so very it's, clean. it's cleaner. Um, parents that bring their kid to a Derek Sagan show, then you're just bad parents. But so I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't adjust for that. But when it's the, I we're careful with the debaters. Yeah. But yeah, we've got. I think it's at eleven or twelve shows book. We're doing one run in Ontario. And then another run in uh, in Alberta. I don't think we're making it up to the Sioux, though, on this. On well, this uh, I, I noticed, unfortunately, not. And I'd like to, uh, I've got a friend who's a big investor. I'm going to talk to him. He just such, such, say, say right here, he just retired and sold his portfolio for millions. And he, he contacted me about shows um, and such. So, anyways, we'd like to bring you to the Sioux. But I see you're playing Sudbury, yeah. but it says to be confirmed. Or to be something? Yeah, I just when I wrote when I sent you the list, I just didn't know the name of the place yet. He he's answered me since then. Okay, I was gonna say um, is that a hotel. We're doing it at some hotel. Um, and again, this is like normally I would have liked it, like you said. I don't have a manager. I do have a tour manager that I've worked with, but I needed to get to work now, right? So I was like putting all my feelers out. Uh, generally, when I go to Sudbury, I would want to. There's, there's this beautiful little place that I found by accident, called the uh, Performing Arts Center, Sudbury Performing Arts Center, or okay. something like that. Yeah. And um, so it was such a perfect theater for stand up. We did two shows in one night. They sold out in no time. Um, but that I, whatever they weren't returning my email, and I just I'm like I gotta get out on the road. I have a show book in Iroquois Falls already so i'm like well fuck out driving all that way so i'll do something on the way up so it's not you know a full 10 hour drive out of the gate yeah so yeah. the sudbury show is at the northbury hotel on brady street northbury okay. hotel okay i April think i know 7th. i think i know the property but it's changed names on brady street okay right on yeah um so what was it oh who would you say right now is an up-and-coming uh, comedian to look out for? Mm -hmm. In Canada? Yeah. Um, and I exclude it's myself. Say, it's, hard, <laughs> it's hard to say up-and-coming. Like, what is it? I feel like I'm still up-and-coming. So it's uh, like I haven't hopefully not arrived at my final destination yet. So I'm... But... Um, a few of my, my favorites are uh, uh, Dave Hempstead, I find very hilarious. Uh, Mark Forward, I, I can't I can't get enough. I don't know if you got, there's a new show on right now hosted by Jay Baruchel. Okay. Called uh, Last One Laughing. Uh, you know, and I, wa I watched the roast battles that uh, that was a Canadian production, and I, I didn't I didn't love it very much at all. Uh, not that I was a huge fan of roasts to begin with, or roast battling. I like roasts. The roast battle thing, I've never really gotten that much into it. When K. Trevor Wilson won one, that was really fun. But the concept of this last one laughing show is the funniest people in Canada um, trying to make each other laugh, but you're not allowed to laugh. If you laugh, you're out. Mm. And uh, I'd like to reaffirm that Colin Mockery is possibly one of the funniest human beings that has ever lived. Even yeah. though he's not a stand-up, and most stand-ups are not huge fans of improv, but yeah. Colin Mockery is so funny. Yeah. He's so funny. Not that he's up and coming. He's probably on his way down. Let's be honest. He's an old man now. <laughs> yeah. Well, good, uh, you brought that up. There used to be a television show. We're about the same age. It was called Make Me Laugh. Do you remember that? No. It was the same thing where you have two people. Um, I think what it was was contestants, like a game show. So the contestant okay. would sit there, and you'd have a panel of three different people would come up, and they're comedians, and they would sit there, and they would say their jokes like within a foot of them, and if they broke and laughed, they were tossed out. And the one okay. who's the last one standing is the one that wins the prize. 
Hmm. So make me laugh. That's basically it. Except yeah. there's no contestants per se. It's all comedians. This show. Oh, it's comedians. That would be difficult. Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, yeah, there's a uh, Dad Di Giovanni, uh, Carolyn Ray, Colin Mockery, John Lajoie of uh, the uh, the uh, those uh, parody songs fame. Um, uh, Dave Foley from Kid in the Hall. Yeah. Uh, Kate Trevor Wilson is in there. Uh, oh, um, uh, Tom Green. Okay. Uh, Br Brandon Ash Mohammed, who is probably in that up, up and coming category. Like, he's pretty new and he got into this thing. It's hosted by Jay Baruchel. Okay. Um, what's her name? May. May somebody. I forget her last name now. Uh, there's a lot of who else is in there. Anyway, good show, really good. I'm really happy to see a production using a Canadian production using comics. That's actually really good. It was a, it's kind of a relief. It's really nice. Speaking of that, there's two there's two comedians that I put in your category. I think you are not up and coming. I think you're um, at a good level, and you know you're just going to get bigger. And I'll ask about that later, but. Uh, two of my favorites as well as uh, Jerry D and Brent Butt. Now, the interesting thing is, the Corner Gas show, for me, sorry, Brent, if I ever ask you to be on the show, the show doesn't uh -huh. really reflect his stand-up, whereas I'm sure you've seen Mr. D or an episode where Jerry, he really brings the same kind of humor to his show. Yeah. I like the show. I thought it was really funny. Me I too. actually really wanted to be on it. I mean, at one point they had a French teacher in there. I'm like, what? How did I not <laughs> even get? I didn't get an audition for this. <laughs> well, maybe it was a female French teacher. It was a female role, exactly. Yeah, but they could, I could, I could, you know, I could be a, a feminine French teacher. I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, but I thought the show was really good. I find Jerry really funny. Yeah, uh, I like it. I, I like his stand up. Yeah. Uh, I think we we have very um, we don't have similar styles, which is good because we have very similar lives, you know, wife, kid, house, whatever, you know, that domestic life. Yeah. Uh, so our, our, um, premises, our subject matter is often very similar. He's just got a much more, uh, although, you know, we have jokes that really overlap. He has a joke about, uh, what being there for the birth of one of his kids and the wife shit her, shit herself. I, I have the same story and I'm like, holy shit. Thanks God, Jerry's kids are younger than my kids. That way, no one's going to accuse me of stealing a Jerry D joke, you know? No, no, you didn't. That's funny. Did you have my to wife shit herself first, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> were, were you? Did you question why you had to wear the rubber boots? That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so, nice you, things so you're there. married again now? No, not married, but I'm. You know. I feel like I'm in prison, so I'll just use that. Oh, okay. It, it, was, <laughs> does it happen to be Angela? Angela, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we went, We just went to a wedding in Florida a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, you And I, post, I posted something like, you know, like, oh, beautiful day for a wedding. And then we got like 100 people congratulating us. Oh, congratulations. I, how come I'm not invited? All this shit. I'm like, no, shut up. No, no. So Angela's like, see, everybody thinks you should be marrying me. I'm like, oh, man, what a one stupid Instagram post, and now i got to listen to this shit. Yeah. No, it wasn't. Just tell people that know me well, too, people that are really close friends with us, like, you didn't tell us that's why you were going to Florida? Oh, you son of a bitch. I'm like, no, we're not. We're at a wedding. See, I can't. <laughs> can't anyway, read between the was, lines. That was not fun. So, um... <clears throat> What's your furthest reach for doing shows outside of Canada? Uh, I went to Latvia right before the uh, the pandemic happened. You went to where? Latvia. Latvia. Uh, how did yeah, you, it's in the, how did you in get the that Balkans? It was a mil Canadian military gig. I was doing a show for the uh, for the soldiers. Oh, very nice. Yeah, which they must be stressed over there right now. I mean, Latvia is it's the top of the Balkans, but I mean, it's right above right. Ukraine there. It's right on the Russian border. It's probably a very stressful time because they're saying uh, see, they're probably next. Should should Putin succeed in Ukraine, what's to stop him from trying to take back the Balkans? You know, the Lithuania, Latvia, and uh, uh, 
uh, what's the other place in Estonia? Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty complicated for sure because I I've been I, I'm I read a lot of world politics work and I've known for eight years that um, the Russian president has said, listen, Ukraine is the red line. If you guys start deploying missiles, and I guess Ukraine in the last year has been talking about joining NATO, and so. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's complicated. We don't know what the media tells us because they usually lie or they usually just prop up what the government tells us. So, I mean, my heart goes out to any soldier of any race out there right now. Let's, let's hope that it gets resolved. Yeah, well, the soldiers is one thing, but the, the people, the people that are no, just no, living right. their life you're in right. a free dem democratic state yeah, they, that finally have their independence, even though I think it's back in 2014, yeah, there was a piece of it that not officially annexed, but that the Russian sympathizing sort of rebels have control over for the last um, yeah. eight years. But the people that you know, like kids waking up to go to school, and all of a sudden there's rockets flying over your house. That's that's yeah, that's very like, unsettling in the world that we live in, especially a guy like Putin who's already using innuendo to threaten or promise whatever you want to call it that yeah. you know if the West inter interfere, well, you will you will, we will. Uh, will reply with yeah with, with um, that has never been seen on earth in history. I read that this morning. Which you read between the lines to know what that is. I mean, Russia's got as you know the second biggest nuclear power on earth. It's very very. It's a very frightening time. I tried to talk to my daughter this morning driving her to school. So it's too early to talk about this. And I'm like, what have I created? You are such a little shit. Like. There's girls your age right now that are trying to find a concrete block to live in until this is finished. See? Yeah. Anyway, it's it's very yeah, it's not very. Uh, I'll be honest, Ernest. I'm not. It's I'm not felt super funny over the last two days. I'm very. I don't. Maybe it's my age. I'm sure there's been military conflict in my lifetime that I haven't paid as much attention to. But this is it, there's something about this that feels really wrong. And I feel you hit the nail on the head too. It's the media and the I keep Googling, like, why? Why is this happening? Why? What does Putin want there? Is it, does Ukraine have diamonds that we don't know of or, or, or natural uh, resource, fuel, oil? Well, and it seems like it's a propaganda game and that he just wants to reestablish the, what used to be the USSR. He wants the same landmass before he retires to match yeah. what it was at its biggest. I don't know. But his, what he's saying, it's it like, it's to the point where I have so little faith in all the world leaders that yeah. I, I almost don't disbelieve. Well, I can't say that, but Putin is basically accusing Ukraine of being full of fascists and that they didn't, the government that's in place didn't actually win an election, that they cheated it, and mm -hmm. that, that they're, they're Nazi-like people with right. a hate for Russia. And their freedom, like that, that sounds crazy coming from Putin. But you know, I, I also feel like the 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 Joe Biden. See, Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau. Through the pandemic, I've kind of lost some faith, but I still feel that those two guys. Maybe I'm being tricked. I still feel like they're in their hearts decent. But I know we've all known decent men to do horrible things. But uh, anyway, it's just a very scary time because I, I've so lost trust in the media. I've lost trust in the world leaders. Yeah. See, and all the shit that's happening, the really shitty things that happen in the world, it's because of the greed and, and incompetence sometimes and sort of desperation to keep the power that they have of yeah. like 80 to 100 people. And... They could, they'll say n'importe quoi. I mean, with Donald Trump, it just made me realize that they, these leaders can say whatever the hell they want. And there's very, even when it's the complete falsehood, there's very little repercussion for their behavior. Well, so it's just, it's very upsetting. Yeah, and, and then you've also got the um, issue with that China-Taiwan. So, like, everywhere we look... Well, like, it, it's see, exciting. yeah, is China going to take this opportunity? Yeah. Say, oh, look, everyone's looking over there. Let's completely obliterate Taiwan and show them once and for all that they are part of the Chinese empire or whatever. Yeah, it's frightening. The, the China is not speaking up right now. They're saying that they're not backing the Russia uh, initiative, but they're also not condemning it. They're not imposing their financial sanction or whatever. Because China is trying to listen beyond the China. If any country has a debt, China holds part of that debt.
Right. So they could they could impose things that could hurt Russia, but I don't think they're going to. Right. Well, I think for um, just for the layperson watching, I think Putin and G kind of have an understanding. You know, I mean, they're keeping the West in check. I think that just my reading. It's frightening. It's frightening that all of our destiny are in the hands of these so few people. And there's, I can't think of one global politician that seems to, like, you look at them and you're like, yeah, this guy got into politics for the right reasons. You know, like, it seems like the, the these positions of power, of leadership, attract just the most self-centered kind of i don't know it's well, a frightening time and i'm sure you say to the lay people like you and i are professional political scientists or something <laughs> <laughs> it's a dick joke guy and a judas priest headbanger <laughs> analyzing the global policies <laughs> yeah, so you we'll fix it everybody don't worry ernest and i are on the case <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's great. Um, what was I going to say next? Um, so growing up, um, who uh, who did you look at as uh, as somebody that maybe you borrowed some of your style from? I don't say anything. Uh, no, I have a uh, my my all time comedy idol. I have an autographed picture. Oh, okay. My girl, my girlfriend keeps putting him in the corner. You don't put baby in the corner. <laughs> Oh, okay. Right on. Yes, he is the best. Yeah, that's my all-time biggest. Uh, I don't know about influence. I mean, I kind of fell ass backward into stand-up, so I, I didn't even occur to me to try to copy a style. But uh, I think we're both long form, so like it's a, it's a whole story with jokes interspersed within the, the thing. <laughs> but he is my all-time favorite. Um. People working today, I mean, in Canada, there's uh, uh, Derek Edwards, who I love, uh, Mike Polmott, who I really love. Um, there's And there's guys like, you know, around my age, my level, Rob Pugh, I find hysterical. Uh, Nathan McIntosh, who's now living in New York City, he's so funny. Yeah. Um, uh, Sean McComber out of Edmonton. See, there's a, I guess we could call him up and comer, even though he's been doing stand up longer than I have. Uh, he just he doesn't have that uh, doesn't that it's not ambition he you know he doesn't have ambition doesn't have he'll never do anything that you know aggressive so he but I find him to be literally one of the funniest people I've ever seen in Canada or elsewhere he's one of the funniest comedians ever yeah um, and him too we have the same life like he has kids I have kids you know like the whole domestic life we have a lot of jokes that overlap he's even been accused of stealing a joke and I know he doesn't like he's as if he spends any time watching people do comedy he doesn't give a shit <laughs> just you live the same life you end up writing about the same things you know yeah yeah you ever watch Comedy Central Roasts yeah I love yeah I mean I think uh, I'm hoping one of my favorites uh, is uh, Jeff Ross yeah, he's really good at that format. Anyway, he's really good. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right at that format because I've heard his his, uh, his comedy CDs and they're kind of like this isn't Jeff, is it? And then you watch him when he does his stand up, um, the, the roast. Anyways, when he comes out in the big afro when he did the uh, David Hasselhoff roast. Yeah, he's uh, he he does a show too with David Tell, who David Tell is really fantastic. Too. David Tell is so prolific too. He turns over material. So fast, yeah. Uh, but he and David Tell were doing this show called Bumping Mics. Okay. Where they, it's kind of like a relay show or like a tag team, whatever. Yeah. Like one would do a joke and they they take the mic and they tap their mics together and then it's his turn to tell a joke or if they tell a really good joke, though it's like a high five as well. But it's the two of them up there just riffing with each other and with the audience, and it's a really really fun show. I'm sure some nights it's shit because you know like it's all. Yeah. Flying by the seat of their pant, but the one I saw was really, really good. David tells a he's a special. You could see when he's up there, like because you know, as a comedian, you look and there's phenomena that happen. Like yeah. some nights, I feel like my brain is firing at a faster speed than reality is even going. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like things, 
like I'm in the middle of saying a sentence, but I'm already thinking of three sentences from now. So the sentence I'm doing now is setting up something I'm going to say in two more sentences from now. And yeah. like, generally speaking, I'm not really good. At it. Like there can't be music playing when I'm trying to do my taxes. See, like I'm very easily <laughs> distract. Something yeah. about when you get into a flow on stage yeah. uh, and you could see that David Tell is like that. David Tell, when he's on stage, he's just sitting there and he'll be very deliberate and slow um, knowing that the big payoff is coming, but the audience, like, you, he'll let the audience be like, oh, man, this is weird. I don't even know. And then, and then he gets them. And so, yeah, David, that was really fantastic. Speaking of politics and comedians, Bill Burr, what do you think? What's that? Speaking of politics and comedians, what do you think of Bill Burr? Bilber, okay, yeah, you did. I didn't get the the related relation to politics. Uh, uh, well, he does. Uh, Bilber's great. Bilber is one of my favorites, also. Yeah, no, uh, I would. Yeah. I would actually say right now in working comics today, I'd say Bill Burr is in the top five for sure. Yeah. Uh, Chappelle being, I think, Chappelle may be the greatest of all time. I mean, I, I love Richard Pryor, and without Richard Pryor, there could have been no Dave Chappelle. Yeah. But Dave Chappelle, I think, is. If you want to make a correlation to politics, uh, Dave Chappelle is a master. Yeah. Uh, it probably doesn't hurt that our our sensibilities definitely uh, interact or intercede or whatever. Yeah. Be, meaning that we're slightly to the left and we care about people and rights, people's rights and equality and to, against all the isms like racism and misogynism and all those. So the fact yeah. that our sensibility are very intertwined Mm -hmm. uh, probably helps me to see the pure genius that is him, but uh, no, no one before has been able to speak of almost the unspeakable. Like there's things that you know, Mike Ward proved through his his lawsuit. There are certain things, as much as we say freedom of speech, there's certain things that society is uncomfortable with us talking about. <laughs> um, but Chappelle, there he finds a way. And, you know, there was, obviously, as soon as you say, like, there's certain people, you just say the word rape in the comedy context, and it's unacceptable to them. They know yeah. there's nothing you can never, um, but if you do have any kind of open mind and don't have triggers, yeah. uh, Dave Chappelle will be able to talk about anything yeah. and, and will hit me anyway. His, yeah. his angle on all the things is, fits with my sensibility. Yes. Stuff like that he admittedly doesn't even understand. For instance, like uh, transgender, when he got, he got on all that shit with the transgender talk. Um, he admits that I don't get it, I don't get it, but also stop, treat them like people. They're people, they're just people. Say, but I don't, I don't get why they like that. But then, you know, like I could say, I don't get why some people like country music. Like, yeah. it's like he simplifies it that way. But again, you say the word transgender, people will freak out. Yeah. It's homophobic, tra transphobic, whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, no, you're missing. You're missing the whole point. Yeah, people don't listen. Uh, George Carlin is another one that uh, was um, big at the beginning. Carlin out the government. These are guys, yeah. These are, you, these are guys that without whom we couldn't, stand up wouldn't be where it is. Starting with, I think, Lenny Bruce. Uh, we have to, it started with him, like saying, pushing the boundary of what society, and even back then, there were laws, decency laws, that said you can't say this, and he was like, fuck that. Uh, being right there was a, uh, was a criminal offense, just saying fuck in public. So, yeah. like, so we've come a long way. So starting with Lenny Bruce, then I would say, um, say he made it so that we could kind of start to say what we want and then Richard Pryor took it to the next level of yeah. saying, you know, crazy things. And then a guy like uh, Andy Kaufman, I, I think, made it not only can we say what we want, but we can say it in any fucked up, backward, weird way that we want. It's like we don't it's not even just what we say, it's how we say it. And yeah. sometimes you say very little. He made it so that stand up could be literally anything as long as you're one person against an audience, that's it. Like standing there with the Mickey Mouse, uh, Mighty Mouse thing, and doesn't say anything. That's yeah. a whole number, see? Yeah. So these guys were definitely pioneers, and then moving on to Carlin, who was doing sort of a little bit more intellectual humor, but in the, what would have been considered a crude way at the time. Yeah. Um, 
but not pulling punches, basically. People before him would be uh, remiss to sort of criticize the the establishment and the yeah. say, the status quo. He yeah. really said, no, why would we? And also talking about the general accepted sensibility of his country. Yeah. You know, the, the seven word you can't say on television. Uh, question that. Why not? Why not? Why can't you say these words? You know, like it's uh, so without those guys, those four guys specifically, I think yeah. uh, my career would not exist if be it not for those at least those four guys and then others that carried out, say that continued their their uh, legacies. Sure. But those, I, I, I've always thought that those four guys are very key to to have a ride where stand up is today. Cool. John yeah. Rivers too should get an asterisk. John Rivers did for female comedians. Oh yeah, uh, sort of took what those four guys did and uh, took the the collective baton from those four and passed it now to womankind, which is wonderful. Yeah. That for uh, sure. like we're Amy, almost at a point where there's equality for the yeah. Amy, Amy Schumer is great. Yeah, Amy Schumer is really funny. Um, two more quick questions, Derek, and then I'll let you go. Um, I was wondering. When you um, when you have a peanut allergy bit, which is is probably the favorite of many many of your fans, um, what prompted you to come up with those names that just fit Tyler and Dylan? Did you have to think about names, or did they just come out? They they popped out the first night that I I, I did it, and they, they just stuck. I guess I guess because I did. Being a comedian afforded me a lot of time with the kids. Like, I say that I don't like spending time with my kid. It's kind of, <laughs> you know, it's tongue-in-cheek. It's an exaggeration. That yeah, I absolutely. could all use some time away from the kid. But yeah. uh, being a comic has afforded me a lot of daytime time where yeah. I get to volunteer at the kids' school. So, actually, throughout the kids' elementary careers, I was at the school quite a bit. You'd say I wasn't a lunch lady or anything, but... <laughs> uh, like any field trip or yeah. they did this thing called fun day it was kind of like the uh, you know potato sack olympics kind yeah, of thing yeah, i would always yeah. be there so i got to meet a lot of their friends we would kids would i live right near the school too so kids would often be over here and i guess dylan and tyler were just two of the most popular names yeah at the time that i came up with those jokes but uh it's funny that you know People do often write to me, oh, my son's name is Tyler. He's not allergic to peanuts, but fucking gluten gives him the shits. You know, things <laughs> like that. Uh, but that's funny. That joke, to show like people's sensibility and where we are in the world. See, uh, I, I've done, I did that joke once and somebody should have told me, but there was somebody in the audience who had actually lost their kid to a food allergy. Okay. Uh, so... I, rightfully was very upset yeah. this was it was a first of all it was a court uh, company show like the show brought their whole company to the thing and i think they hired me based on seeing that joke Probably. and you didn't think like it's two years before you have an employee that lost a child to a thing like you didn't think that that might be something you should mention to me too Anyway, I got tons of hate mail about that. People were like, you fucker, how would you like, I'm going to come kill one of your kids, see how you feel? And I'm like, what the back neck? I did a joke about peanuts. Everybody take it easy. <laughs> and then I ended up speaking to the lady, and she was like, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. What the worst thing that could ever happen to anybody? Yeah. If, if I did anything, forget the joke. If I even said her favorite color or mentioned her name by mistake, because it's I know somebody else with the same name. Uh, you have every right to be mad. It's the worst thing. I'm so sorry. And then by the end of it, though, she was like, it's nice when a grown man can admit when they're wrong. And I was like, well, that's not, I'm not exactly saying I was wrong. I was just going to say that. I'm you sorry are... to you. Yeah. I'm being, I, I'm sympathetic and, yes. and empathetic, but I, it's not wrong. We can joke about everything. There's nothing that's off limits. If the intention is not to hurt, my intention in doing that joke wasn't to hurt you. In fact, I'm very sensitive to how people feel. Yeah. Had I have known your situation and that you were in the audience, I would have e definitely foregone. I'm not one of those comedians that, no, this joke's funny, fuck you, I'm doing it, I don't yeah. care. It's their problem, you know what I mean? No. Losing a kid, I mean, yeah. if you can't have absolute empathy to do whatever you can to not drudge that up for somebody, you're an asshole, yeah. I'm sorry, you're just an asshole. So I had to tell her, I'm like, listen, I'm happy to make a donation in your daughter's name to the, there's a, there's, turns out there's a food allergy association. So I made a donation 
But I did tell her, I said, I am going to continue to do that joke, but let me tell you that you have given me pause and food for thought that there, sh there could be repercussions specifically about this one joke. But as comedians, if we start worrying about everybody's feeling, like I had a guy walk out of a show, uh, I was in Halifax, and I used to do this joke about cause the first time I went to PEI. I was like, oh, it's so exciting. My first time here this is like the last province I'd never been to. This is so good. What do they got here? Oh, my potatoes. Wow, that's so cool. What else do they got? Nothing. Fucking potatoes. That's it. <laughs> so I was like, this place is shit. Let me out of here. And then it's like 80 bucks to get out of the place, you know, free to go this way on the bridge, but 80 bucks to go that way. You fucking tricksters, PEI suck it in your little fucking... <laughs> the hand of gable brown gables whatever yeah. a guy so it's a potato joke i'm shitting on potatoes yeah. and the guy stands up smashed his beer bottle on the floor he's like fuck you man potato farming is hard you son of the bitch frenchy prick <laughs> and i'm like what the what <laughs> i'm like is he joking and he's like he left after the show people came on sorry He's very sensitive right now. His father died three days ago, and his father was a potato farmer, so, you know, just caught him off guard. <laughs> and I'm like... Yeah. <clears throat> and, in your, and in your stand-up, too, uh, you know, you, men you mentioned in that same uh, piece about, um, you know, if uh, somebody gets cancer, everybody have to go through chemotherapy. You're not attacking cancer uh, people because cancer is one of the most predominant killers of mankind. You're just making an analogy, and I think people understand that. But if I have something funny to say about cancer, I'm going to say it. We can't make things off limits. <clears throat> this is it's the free society we live in. If it's funny, it's funny. Um, That's right. See, like, there's people, uh, like, this lady was a very specific thing, but I've had people come up to me after doing the allergy joke. People come up to me like, oh, my God, yeah, it's brutal, right, having to walk around with an EpiPen. Both my kids are allergic to shit. Like, I have one that's allergic to fucking kiwi. And I'm like, yeah, what the hell is that? Where did that come from? Kiwi, let's see. So people are automatically sensitive because it affects them, right? Like, <laughs> Mark Forward has a really great joke about that and a lot of comedians do what mark forwards is really great where he'll do a joke about cancer and they'll be like oh yeah it's so true right it's so true that's so funny and then he'll do a joke about like diabetes oh my god you can't even talk about it it's so funny and then he just does a joke about cirrhosis and they're like no that's not funny surely you know how i struggled with my cirrhosis my, it's not easy to have flaky skin on your elbows fuck you mark forward <laughs> so, it's like people are so entitled now that you know it's funny as long as it doesn't affect me but as soon as it affects me my sense of humor goes out the window and like i have tr i'm triggered uh we're too easily triggered and sadly it's i mean this could be a four-hour podcast it's like the we live in the greatest place in the world i think uh canada despite our political let's call it uh, question of questionableness. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We live in such a wonderful country of so much room and resources, despite ourselves and despite the fact that we're wasting. Uh, there's tons of room for improvement, don't get me wrong, but we're so very lucky. And safety and See, and what it's doing is creating those, uh, I forget even who, whose quote this is, it may have been Martin Luther King, but I'm not certain, but it's um, uh, uh, tough times create strong men, uh, and strong men create easy times, and easy times create weak men, and weak men create tough times. It's a yeah, and we are definitely in the easy times. Uh, we are, and we are. My generation, I think, is is they, we're post wars. Uh, my generation is a group of weak men and women uh, that are making probably even more mumun spoiled kids entitled the entitlement i feel of just general western society i mean westerns i'm not well traveled in europe or anything but traveling through canada and the united states the, the, there's a generation and there's wonderful millennials millennials that are eager and ambitious and kind and whatever but in as a generalization i think the the uh, sense of entitlement and disregard for others and the empathy 
uh, is shocking sometimes. It's at a shocking level uh, yeah. in young people. Um, and I, I worry moving forward that, you know, certainly like my kid talking to my son, my 21 year old son this morning about what's happening in Ukraine. And I'm like, yeah, they could, they could start the conscription again. There could be a draft, but you're right in there. You should have gone to university. You might've avoided it. And the fucking panic, the panic in his eyes, like, oh my God, I can barely, I can barely chop salad. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, cause I, I did my best as a parent, but yeah. now that I'm 22 years into being a parent, I'm like, I could have done better. I could have. See, tough love is hard in the moment. It's hard for the yeah. kid, and it's hard for the parent. Yeah. I feel sometimes like I took the lazy way out. It was always easier to, like, please, daddy, please. Okay, okay, here you go. And now I have these fucking entitled moments that, you know. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I've got a 23-year-old, but I'm, I'm proud of her as well, and you're right exactly about the tough love thing. You know, I was dating a girl at one point, and she was a really good role model for my daughter as well. And she would say, this is what you got to do. And I'm like, I don't know if I should. No, this is what you have to do, because if you don't, the next time it happens, it's going to be easier for her to say, last time you didn't do this, Dad. So then it's all about parenting. Um, last question I want to ask you, Derek, is what was the worst show that you can remember um, performing live and and uh, what happened? And don't say Susan. No, 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 this is an easy one. Uh, I, I'm lucky. I'm going to knock on wood. I haven't had very like. I do think it's important for comedians to bomb to get better, but every comedian has a different level of bomb. Luckily, my level, I feel my level, like I feel like, nah, I really didn't do very well tonight. Another comedian, are you kidding? You got a standing ovation. I'm like, yeah, well, one bomb. I have one mega fucking bomb, like pulled the plug on me, bomb. Like if they had one of those hooks, they would have pulled it. And I have no trouble talking about it because the failure, I mean, one could say, that a good comedian will, no matter what the circumstance, will be able to to pull it off. Yeah. I disagree in this one, so I have no trouble saying it either. And if anybody out there, if your listeners in the the market for a garage door, don't ever buy a fucking Garaga garage door. <laughs> Fuck Garaga. Uh, anyway, it was a corporate show for Garaga garbage garage doors. <laughs> Sucks, too, because they actually are the best garage doors, but I, I needed a new garage door, and there was no way I was putting a garage door, so now I've got this piece of shit, styrofoam bullshit, <laughs> just yeah. out of principle. <clears throat> but uh, So anyway, it was the golf tournament that they wanted me to do stand-up, and it was uh, friend in French, so Steve Patterson had done the Ontario English show, so they asked, oh, we're doing one for our Quebec office in Quebec, you know, a French comedian, he recommended me, whatever I get there, so it's like a four-hour drive to saint jean de Beauce. Um, so they play golf all day, come in, they have dinner, and then they have the president come out, and he spoke for close to an hour, almost a full hour, uh, and then they, they did like another hour of door prizes, just peaching things like golf ball, like an hour, tons of prizes. Then the president came on, did another 15-minute wrap-up of the year and the subjectives and blah, 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 and then... At the end of that, two and two hours and plus after dinner, so they, everyone ate, drank, had to sit through two hours of the president talking to them. You can't leave when the president's talking, right? That would be rude. At the end of the thing, the president's like, all right, so now let's get on with the evening. It's time for some fun. Derek Sege, not fucking uh, comedian Derek Sege, not uh, say here's some, uh, some give me some credits, you know, yeah. five times just for real and just for a laugh. No, just direct again, I see, and people immediately, as soon as they said my name and the president started walking off, 96% of the room also stood up and walked in the other direction to go to the bathroom, to go to the, get a beer, to have a cigarette, to do whatever. So I'm standing there, a room that had 350 people in it. Now I'm looking at literally nine people. <laughs> and the whole room is back there at the bar. They're all chatting with each other. And I'm like... <laughs> And there's like four, God bless these four younger people were just like, no, you're doing good. Go ahead. No. <laughs> so funny. Like, like really trying to sell. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, thank you very much. That's really nice. And then my, the lady that had was my contact that hired me, whatever, 
after like I was supposed to do uh, forty five minutes, she after fifteen minutes she come up, she's like, <laughs> just get off. Like people in the back that were chatting with each other were getting annoyed that I was getting louder and louder. They're like they can't hear their own conversation, and I'm like, well, I never had a chance. So that's it. I don't feel bad because I never had a chance. I had seven people listening, and three hundred and fifty not listening. If they're not listening, what can I do? I can't do it. They have to at least hear some of the word, say for me to make them laugh. So maybe, uh, but that was the worst. Maybe take your cordless mic and walk out back to the bar. Maybe, like I said, a good comedian, I guess, could pull it off no matter what happened. Yeah, maybe I could have gone back there. Uh, I was still pretty new at the time. I think this was like two and a half years, and it's probably 2007 or eight that yeah. this happened. I, they, but the other thing, they didn't pay me either. They didn't pay me. They, I drove yeah. all the way to St. John de Beauce. Like, our job, basically, when we get paid, we're getting paid for the travel. The joke yeah. part is about 5%, see? I'm only there for 45 minutes, but like if I was to go to Thunder Bay, that's like a, a fucking journey. That's a voyage. <laughs> that is like, in 100 years ago, that would take two months <laughs> of my life. You know what I mean? So like, when I get there, they're like, well, really, you're gonna pay, you have to pay this much? I'm like, bro, do you know what I had to go through? I must have ended up in Winnipeg by mistake. This is bullshit. I had to go far to get here. Dog sledding across the James Bay. That's it. So, so, yeah, so they didn't the moral of the story is fuck Garaga. <laughs> right, everybody? Are you with me? When I say fuck, you say Garaga. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time, Derek, man. It was a pleasure. Cheers, buddy. And, um, you know, we'd love to see you here back in the Sioux. And, uh, um, you know, if we can make that happen, that'd be great. But uh, in the meantime, keep doing what you're doing. You make a lot of people happy, and especially during the... Uh, the pandemic um you uh, lit up a lot of lives man thanks man thank you so much and uh yeah if you hear of anything let me know a venue that would be interested in buying the Derek Sega experience maybe maybe we'll get you out of the arcade but that that is a good venue but yeah there's a it's it was massive anyway i don't know like before it was an arcade was it like a space shuttle assembly facility i see it was huge yeah, I remember it, it was actually big. a call it was a call center and then it was a local before that but it was big yeah, yeah it's really big okay man yeah, i'm know. always i'm always game to go everywhere as long you know it's thunder they have an airport so like you're not out of food around but as long as i don't have to drive to thunder bay that would be a that would well, be I'm a in the experience uh, that's what i mean in the suit to stay mad yeah but yeah, it's the same thing. It would be a two one. Even further, yeah. You're even further than Thunder Bay, right? No, no, closer. You got to go Sudbury to St. Louis, then up to Thunder Bay. Okay. Well, either yeah. way, I'm up to, I'm down for anywhere. <laughs> Sorry, my I've been in this house for two years. My geography is a little bit rusty. It's all right, man. <laughs> okay, uh, all the best to you, Derek, and thanks again for uh, for speaking. Thanks. With you. Thank you, man. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Bye, Susan Mary and Thunder Bay and Northern Ontario region. Enjoy Thanks. your cold. And please subscribe. And don't forget to subscribe. The opposite of unsubscribe.